Um, right at the Doge the Doug for the talk about the care and feeding of microservices. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, once a year, you have to listen to me as well. So um, bear with me. Sorry, I just need to silence this this thing. I think I'm even just going to turn it off uh, before we do any much more because it's got a, a bit of... Uh, now it won't even turn off. Can you believe it? I, uh, what happened to the on off switch? Can you believe it? So Android has now gone the full route that Apple has and they even prevent you from turning off your device. I didn't understand that. And now she's fighting with me. Power off. Okay. Now she won't interrupt us anymore. Okay. So um Thank you for uh, for joining us. Um, ah, I always put up the slide. A little bit about me. Uh, I've worked with a few different languages over a long period of time by a variety of, of systems. And at the moment, I would call myself a software architect with skin in the game. Um, and I think you all know architects that don't have skin in the game. So, um, and I love to share some of my favorite quotes. This is one I live by. Albert Einstein, basically, to paraphrase, everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. Um, so uh, you can oversimplify and you can overcomplicate, and that's a fine balance in software because you never know which way you are making the mistake. Um, oh, this one is actually one of my own. The measure of bureaucracy is the distance between authority and responsibility. And that's something that I've learned uh, over the years. Um, anybody who's worked in a corporate will understand this. Um, uh, I said it 15 years ago after some uh, interesting experiences. And uh, it's probably true for most um, corporates still. Um, what do we want to talk about? What is a microservice? Um, how to create a microservice? How do you size a microservice? And um, how do you grow them? Now, um, uh, creating a microservice, uh, uh, a lot has been discussed and demonstrated and live coded. You can go and watch Joss Long do one in 15 minutes, uh, where he goes start.spring.io and uh, as they say, Wurzwarts, and you have a microservice. Um, then, um, Sorry, I just need to. And I'm hoping that we will have some uh, common ideas on what is a microservice after this talk. Sizing, well, you should not be sizing them. You should be creating them by decomposing a, an existing system. So you start by creating something. And if it turns out that, um, uh, the team is actually struggling and stepping on each other and this thing becomes unwieldy, then it might indicate that you need uh, separate services because you don't set out to create multiple microservices because then you just end up with disconnected things that are difficult to manage. And Martin Fowler has a great uh, talk about the subject. Now, a confession. This is a trap. You know, in school, uh, you start the new year and you're very excited because this year uh, we are going to have sex education for the first time. And the word has gone around that this new young teacher that started is going to be the one 
that's going to be your sex ed teacher and everybody's really excited and then when you get there it turns out no nope, it's still the same old guy and he's giving you an egg to look after for two weeks so this talk is not a sex education talk this is a parenting lesson so i'm going to talk about the team that you build around a microservice so how do we build very complex systems how do we get something simpler uh, why do we build over the complex uh, systems how do we get something simpler how do we reduce the cost while delivering quicker how do we remain competitive and how does a system survive for the next 20 years so if we um uh look at these concepts they are all involved in the life cycle of uh, systems so um, requirements design develop test deploy monitor manage analyze both in what i would call the functional and the system design in other words uh, the system itself and uh, the world it lives in because you are not going to start by building hardware and then building an operating system and then building a database and all those things and eventually answering the needs of your customer. No, you are going to leverage a lot of technology and then you are going to build something. So that separation between functional and system is uh, the functional would be the things you build yourself and the system are the things that you rent or buy. And um, if we look at system architectures over uh, the last, hmm, where are we now? Uh, 60, 70 years. Um, it started with the computer. I don't know how many of you have read um, Isaac Asimov, but quite a few of his stories had a programmer with a computer and that thing was serving the whole planet and um, he never envisioned many computers and um, in fact that people would own many computers as i sit here i have just one laptop but i have a phone that is much more capable than my previous laptop and i have a tablet that's just as capable and I have a, a watch on my arm that has a, I think about a 700 meg processor and about a um, 500 meg of RAM and, 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 and stuff like that. So it's a very different world from what even the best uh, science fiction authors could imagine. Um, but then uh, they started building mainframes and multiple of them and they had terminals um, initially a terminal and then uh, many terminals and um, in the late 60s and early 70s we um, started getting mid-range mid systems with um, terminals that were much more affordable um, and um, in between that and uh, the intranet and, and internet uh, we had um, uh, um, various scales of systems, but if you look at that progression from a mid-range with terminals to all of a sudden a single site that is accessible to a whole company or accessible to the whole planet. And another concept we have is a single page um, application. We have we had workstations and servers. We had single user um, applications. We had desktop applications. We had client server applications. And we have mobile applications. Some mobile applications don't need to be connected to anything. They serve their purpose, typically in distracting you from getting work done by making you addicted to uh, uh, Tetris or um, uh, some card game that I will not mention for lonely people. Um, um, 
or they're widely connected and they suck you into a network of evil. But as we can see, uh, things have changed and they're changing uh, very quickly. Some changes are surprising and um, some are predictable. So let's look at some of these architectures. So when we had a workstation and, um, and servers, so this was before the typical client server. Um, so I'm now talking um, late seventies when they had a workstation and that was an expensive machine that was quite capable, but you were sharing stuff with other people and that stuff was on a server and you were using RPC. And um, initially you had DC e and RPC as, as some of the standards there and later on, um, in the middle 90s, we got uh, Corbo. But the bottom line is that you had a service that exposed an endpoint that an application could consume. And that typically relied on a, net a network with a relative uh, low latency and reasonable bandwidth because it was fairly chatty between uh, the application and the server. Um, with web architectures, we have HTTP, and you'll have a web server like Apache or Nginx uh, that sends a request to a web server like Tomcat, and um, Apache can forward the HTTP, or it can use the AJP uh, plugin to talk to uh, Tomcat. Um, WebSphere has a plugin that lives in uh, um, Apache, which they've hidden behind a veneer that they call the IBM uh, web server or an edge server. And within Tomcat, you run an application that uh, typically leverages the Java serverlet spec. And you use JDBC to talk to a database like uh, MySQL. So that's a fairly simple thing that you can put together reasonably easy and it's fairly well understood but there's already a lot provided for you. Now, if we want to scale that thing, um, we put these things on different boxes. So now we'll have an Apache. Now, Apache by itself on a even relatively small server can serve a huge amount of traffic. So uh, it's gonna be rare for you to need more than one instance of Apache to um, provide uh, services to an application. But your application tier is typically where things can get rough and that's the thing that you would want to scale. So you would have an application tier and you would have multiple instances of Tomcat separated over um, multiple uh, runtime environments. And the Apache can um, uh, distribute load across uh, to multiple workers um, on different machines using the same AJP connector or by forwarding um, HTTP using the mod proxy uh, plugin. But now when you run multiple Tomcats, you want to make sure that anything you make cache and especially your session cache, you would want to distribute. So you can use something like Hazelcast and uh, that's a JSR 107 compliant uh, cache implementation. And, um, or you can even configure Hazelcast directly in Tomcat as a um, session cache. So the application doesn't even know about it. So if the application doesn't actually do any internal caching, you can still leverage Hazelcast to uh, distribute your session cache so that when a node goes down, um, the customer will not even be aware of it because uh, the session is in Hazelcast that's distributed across the nodes and um, uh, the session will just be retrieved from uh, the closest Hazelcast. And you will then scale your database vertically at the back uh, but you can also scale your database horizontally, but typically you will have one node that you write to, 
and you will have multiple read replicas and um, that way you can alleviate the scalability. Now, if you get to enterprise environments, then you get a new kettle of fish because they've heard of the notion of services and they've built an email service and a document service and a, uh, they leverage a message queue service and maybe they've even wrapped that in some other API and they might have an SMS service and some expensive database service. And um, at the application tier level, they'll be using a business process engine and a rules engine and uh, your application must support multiple channels. So it can get really, really early. So for example, if we just look at the, um, the front end, uh, you might have portlets that live in a portal server and you might have um, uh, uh, some dedicated uh, uh, UI component that talks specifically to a, um, um, the same endpoint uh, that lives within some desktop application or maybe um, if you look at um, uh, the problem of call centers. I don't know if you've noticed, but the last two years call centers have become uh, difficult in the sense that you more often hear the term that the system is slow. And that's because they've all switched to web-based systems that aren't properly set up to scale and aren't responsive. And um, the call center agent has to wait for the system to respond and nobody has given care. Uh, when in fact you needed a UI component within a framework that um, will deliver a quick response and will make calls to a back end as needed um, very efficiently. You can have a web application or a mobile application, but all talking to the same endpoint. Within your application tier, you will have um, uh, business processes. Um, I prefer to use an embedded uh, BPM engine um, uh, like Flowable as an example or Camundo um, because they're just as capable as something that can live outside, but it's inside my application. There's no surprises. I know which version of which process I'm running and um, um, it works well for me. But a lot of people spend a lot of money and they have an external business process and then have to make calls to services to get things done. And it becomes a convoluted mess. And they have rules engines, which they also insist on putting outside the application, which you now have to make a call to. And all those calls are expensive because uh, they're over the network and there's latency and throughput limitations because the network isn't instantaneous and the throughput isn't um, infinite. Um, your service tier, so I've specifically looked at technology agnostic services here, that's what I'm referring to. So these are things that could be shared by different applications, they're not specific to any application. Um, and um, it's typically things that would be shared amongst uh, services and would need a, be needed across a, a corporate environment. So you might be familiar with those, you might have built some of those or tried to consume them. And um, then there's some expensive uh, database server. Now, if we come back to this um, model of ours, um, the lifecycle domain, we can take all of this and we could break it down across plan, build and run. So plan means that uh, you need to formulate some kind of plan of what it is that you want to do. So you want to ask a lot of questions to understand the problem. You want to do investigation about what's available out there. What are ways to solve this problem before you just start building stuff. So people use the term MVP in different ways and they, they, they invariably use MVP to to talk about the first release, but MVP is not the first release. MVP is something that you use to prove the viability of what you want to build. So it does not imply uh, the first release version. So first release should be called first release. And that has its own set of criteria because 
that has to be of such a quality that you do not want to lose a, any customers because there's some markets that if your first release has a bad experience, you're dead. You're not going to get anybody else because they talk to each other. Um, so planning is something that people often underestimate and I will simplify and it hurts them further on. Then bold is, well, we need to, uh, to build this thing. And there's a lot of activity involved in building it. And um, a lot of you spend a lot of time in those activities. And then when you run this thing, you have to monitor and manage it and all kinds of things. So now you take all these things and you put together uh, this kind of matrix. So now you can see uh, plan, bold, and run cuts across um, the various requirements. And I've put functional and system on um, um, uh, the list of columns so that they can now intersect with requirements. So you have functional requirements and you have system requirements, which is sometimes referred to as non-functional requirements. And then uh, you want to do some design. People think um, when we use the term agile, we don't have to design, we don't have to document. No, you still have to design. And what is design? It's about proposing a solution and talking to people about it because building it costs so much more than putting a, a good diagram on paper and talking through your design. So um, that's what I mean by design. Develop is when you're actually um, building something, uh, you're building tests around it, and um, you have uh, separate test activities which are dedicated on, um, on testing. But testing also implies that um, people are actually doing um, an analysis of how do we test this thing? Um, what do we need to do to, uh, to test uh, the various components? Because the better you can test the components, uh, uh, the fewer surprises there are when you get to the next level of integration. Because you can't just do testing on your fully integrated system. Because to get to a fully integrated system takes a certain amount of time and you lose a lot of opportunity for uh, finding problems and fixing them. I've got deploy as a separate step because it's something by itself, which if you do well, can take away a lot of heartache. If you do it badly, it um, just causes mess. Um, monitor. So that's now where... Um, you're running the system, you need to understand what's happening because if uh, somebody says there's a problem and it's a surprise to you, then it means that you are not monitoring your system correctly. So monitoring, um, I don't have a tick on the functional column, which is actually incorrect because you need monitoring at the functional level and at the system level because the functional level will be um, monitoring across um, uh, uh, user activity so that you can figure out what did a user do before he got here because that user might not be able to tell you um, but if you have proper monitoring now that's typically covered by um, tools that support something like the open tracing spec which allows you to correlate various activities across different um, systems with some unique identifier and um, you can follow this thread through and see what what did actually happen in what sequence and um, will allow you to uh, quickly uh, get to a problem uh, that you might otherwise miss manage is the activity of improving the system through uh, what you gather from uh, monitoring and from analytics. So uh, some of these things might feel out of order, but the reality is that you are always iterating between um, all of the check marks um, in this block. Uh, and as I said, there's even the ones that, um, uh, that are um, 
um, that might be missing, like uh, monitoring at the functional level, managing at the function level, and analytics, which actually um, should run across uh, the whole shooting match. Because you need to know how long it takes to do certain things, because um, even though Agile doesn't want to even try and predict stuff, um, it does help if you start building up some analytics uh, to try and understand um, what was the prediction and what was the outcome and what can you learn from that so that we can start improving um, some of that because we invariably work for customers who still want a prediction and they definitely want a prediction in terms of the money because they don't have infinite budget. So, um, and now it gets more complicated because once the system is running, we want changes. The customer wants to change this and they want to change that. And, um, or uh, they want something to be cheaper. Uh, so now you have to move from the very expensive database to a less expensive database or to a database that is supposedly free. Um, you might find vulnerabilities in um, your, your own system or in some library that you've used. It can complicate things. Operating system updates. If you don't keep up to date, you're going to be in trouble. Um, if you're in a, in, a, in, a, um, in a corporate environment, there are network changes that take place all the time and they might hurt you. Um, denial of service attacks. Uh, you're not big enough to attract attention or important enough and um, uh, that can hurt you. People try to penetrate the application. If you wanna have some fun, spin a, um, a simple Apache web server up on um, any of the cloud environments and watch the log file. That's all you do. Just watch the log file and you will see a, a penetration attempts coming in after a while when people discover there's a new address on the internet and um, you'll quickly learn what these penetration attempts look like. So how do we make all of this simpler? Now, the way we do that is by simplifying the team. So we need to make sure that the team has a core focus and doesn't get too big because as we add people, we need to communicate more and human communication is actually very expensive. And as we know, it's not always efficient. We need to strengthen and agree on principles. So we need to know what it is that we're doing, how we're doing things. And uh, by doing that, we can uh, um, improve all of this. We need to define the boundaries of what we're doing. We need to clarify ownership. So um, if you're an organization that supports a customer base with a large number of use cases, you will invariably need multiple teams to work on this. You can't have one big team because it will literally, um, uh, I don't know if you've seen these videos, there's this festival, I'm not sure if it's in Spain or Italy, and everybody's in the town square and they're just throwing overripe tomatoes at each other and um, it will literally look like that um, in the office because everybody is all over each other and um, nobody seems to get anything done so you want to make sure that ownership is clear boundaries are clear and that um, you keep the teams um, lean and mean. That implies that um, you don't want them too big, but they need to be big enough to uh, um, get something done and to be able to deal with the absence of uh, um, uh, one or two people. Because if you look at any, any, any organization over a period of time, they are all, um, uh, probably between five and 10% of the staff are absent at any one point in time. And um, okay, it's probably not that bad because if we look at 200 working days, 
uh, people get um, what 15 to 20 working days so it could be 10 percent yeah so it could be between five and ten percent and in a time where we live now where everybody's under stress it could be higher so uh, you need to be able to deal with that so this is the thing that you need to do is you need to simplify uh, the team and make sure that everybody knows who's working on what um, something else that uh, we need to do is we need to simplify that thing that we deploy and one of the key elements in that is called the 12 factors i don't know if you've seen this but most cloud environments today try to support this to some extent a few of them uh, hit all the check boxes but the bottom line is that um, these are the things that uh, give you a level of distance and separation between the runtime environment and the application because you don't want an application that's bound very specifically to a very specific um, operating system or version of operating system or um, distribution of operating system uh, you want to try and decouple yourself and uh, these principles uh, allow you to do that so first of all a code base in revision control and that includes everything about uh, your source code how you build that source code, how you deploy that source code, how you manage it. You want all those things under version control because without that, you are invariably going to end up in trouble. Dependencies must be explicit. So uh, there are tools that can help you to, to determine that. I built a Gradle plugin once that would scan a Java code base and it would then also scan the declared dependencies and it would then tell you whether you actually have imports to packages that are not part of um, the packages that you are declaring as imports in other words if you depend on a transitive dependency this thing will tell you that because you need to know that because you need to make that dependency explicit so that if um, something changes in um, the package in between yourself and that transitive package uh, you don't want to be surprised you want to you, um, inject your configuration in an environmental variable so whether it's a url to a file somewhere that you can retrieve to get more information or whether it's uh, five properties in the environment, um, that doesn't matter. But the bootstrap of your config must be in the environment so that the application can be checking. You have one instance of your application that's been built that can be deployed anywhere. And by giving it uh, one or more environmental variables, it can bootstrap itself using the correct configuration. You don't want the configuration embedded in the application. You don't want the thing to have to go and look at specific files in specific places because this organization might say, no, we don't put files over there. We put them over there and now your application can't read there. So uh, that's important. Backing services as attached resources. So that means that you have those services like I showed you that um, email service or whatever. Is essentially a resources that you can attach to which means that uh, you have a clear definition of how to get to the resource um, that is uh, typically a url of some kind and uh, not some convoluted mechanism to talk to it or some proprietary um, me uh, mechanism you want build release and run a separate stage so what that means is that when somebody commits code, you build it and you express and uh, you publish that uh, artifact into a binary repository, and that's a snapshot. 
and you run tests on it before you do that. So now you know that uh, build X is fine. Then you can decide I want to release build X because you can't release build X unless build X has built successfully. So release X is the same as build X, but it's now tagged as release X and there can't be another release X ever. So thereafter it's X plus one or whatever. So now that release goes into a binary repository. Now, whether that release is a, a jar or a war or a ear or a Docker image, it is uniquely tagged and it will never have, never uh, change uh, after that. Uh, if you want to change it, it's a new release. So that's key. And then the run means you take it from that binary repository and you run it. So whether it's a, a, um, a Maven repository or it is a, um, a, 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 a Docker image repository, um, you take it from the repository and you run that. And those three things should be separate stages because that means that uh, you can pick what you want to run and um, you release when you're ready. And um, if you want those two things to follow each other, then it's a simple matter of having um, a separate mechanism that strings them together. And then you have a continuous deployment or continuous delivery. You want to run one or more stateless processes. Now, what does that mean? I had an interesting uh, thread on uh, um, Twitter just the other day. Somebody asked, what's this thing with everybody is uh, um, obsessed with immutability and statelessness. And um, uh, the bottom line is that um, if you carry state, so remember that uh, uh, diagram I showed where we had the Tomcat with uh, um, uh, um, session cache in Hazel cost. You need to know something about the client or the session that you are dealing with at some point. And that session, the bigger it is, the more difficult it is to move that session around. And that session is basically this, um, the smallest or the largest state that you want to carry. So if you are building a game engine and, and people are playing a game remotely, then you are going to have some shared state centrally because they are participating in the same world. And then you are going to work very hard to deal with changes to that state. And that's going to be uh, the sole aspect of a large part of your, your work. But in general, uh, you want these processes to be stateless because being stateless means that uh, they can be replaced, they can be updated uh, cheaply, and your risk goes way down. So in my view, it's important to know what elements that you're working with are uh, considered uh, part of the state of the system. In other words, they go into the session, and what of it is not. So if you can store something in a database, and the application then goes down, then it's in the database. And then a next request can hit another instance of the application and get the same database state and continue. So the, the state that you can persist outside of the process um, um, and ideally under um, uh, the control of a transaction um, is valuable because you can now have requests that change your state from one state to the next. And that's the reason I love um, uh, uh, talking about and building state machines because it's a controlled way of managing your change of state in a world where uh, you want to have control of it. And if you have a way of making it explicit and being able to reason about it, then you have much more value. Export services via port binding. So that means that uh, services can be configured to listen to port X and you can bind port X to port Y and that way um, 
uh, 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 the producer and the consumer of said service are tied to any specific port. Obviously, browsers, if you type in HTTP colon slash slash something, they go to port 80, unless you give it a specific port. And if you go to HTTPS, they go to port 443. So there are conventions and, and, and standards in place, but nothing prevents you from using uh, it differently. Um, concurrency in process over threads. So what does that mean? That means that if you want to do the same thing many times, it's safer and in a sense cheaper to have multiple processes than to have multiple threads. Why? Because having the multiple processes is simpler and fewer mistakes can be made. When you start working with threads, then you need to visit Dr. Heinz Kabutz first because he is the specialist when it comes to concurrency. Or you need to talk to Martin Thompson and he will show you ways to avoid concurrency and still be fast. So it's a speciality by itself and um, people want to um, trivialize it and it's not trivial and it can bite you. Uh, disposability. That means you want this thing to be able to shut down gracefully so that uh, some disaster never leaves your backing services in a um, damaged or indeterminate state. That's the, typically what that means. Uh, keep development test production in parity. That means that you want your test and production environments to look the same in terms of topology. Because if there's a bug that's related to the topology and you don't have a way of testing it because it, that topology only exists in production, then you are going to have difficulty. So if anybody um, uh, uh, fights with you about no, we can't afford to have a test environment that looks like production. Well, then you say you can't afford to have production because you are not interested in uh, solving the big problems when they arise. Treating logs as event streams. That typically means that you want that uh, log output to go somewhere that can consume them and distribute them and do all kinds of things with them. So there are a series of events that. Um, uh, can be used in all kinds of, of analytics and observability, and it's a whole discipline by itself. So each of these things I've talked about so far, you can see are disciplines that have multiple talks and books and specialists behind them. Admin management tasks are one of processes. So typically what that means is that um, you want, if you have a... Um, uh, an admin task or a management task. Let's say you need to do a database update um, or um, you want to run some batch that makes some kind of, of changes. You want to run those as a once-off process uh, and that's then completed. So what that also implies is that you need to have a way of tracking whether that thing has happened or not because these things typically change the system in a way that you cannot just go back to easily. And that is why you want to manage this explicit once-off process where the once is key um, and um, you have control of that. So here's some more principles that uh, uh, speak about um, uh, that matrix of ours. Don't add people unless really necessary. And that's true because if you add somebody and you now have to spend time getting them up to speed, it detracts from what you are trying to do. And it's another person that's now involved in discussions and decision making and whatever. So, and every person you add can close to double. Uh, the number of interactions needed. And there's nice graphs that um, illustrate that. So keeping the team small 
is um, often uh, the best way. Don't try the job with the wrong tools. Um, anybody who's tried to uh, uh, um, hit a nail into a wall with a pair of pliers will know that um, you will invariably get your uh, finger pinched in some horrible way. Um, don't build your own framework, please. Um, there are beautiful frameworks out there. The JavaScript world has yet to learn. They build new frameworks every week. And um, um, it can get messy. Let somebody um, else do that. Um, let them build it. Let them support it. And please then support them in doing this. Don't think because they've done it, it's now free and you can make demands on them. Um, support them. Ask your organization, okay, we're using all these open source projects as a basis for our work. How much are we going to contribute to those projects um, uh, to help them run? The platform, so that's the hardware. You might have heard platform as a service. Rent the platform, don't build it. Just last week I had to explain to um, a um, um, IT person from a government department why they should not be buying hardware for a data center that does not exist yet. Um, and I should rather uh, rent hardware uh, from one of the cloud providers that are competing for their business and that can do this better and cheaper than they can ever imagine. Rent the backing services if you can. Um, if you've ever lost a database, you will know what it means to have a world-class team looking after your data. And um, that's why, no, don't try and manage your own email server. Don't try and manage your own database server. Don't try and manage your own message queue server. Rent them from a cloud provider because they are going to provide you with a much better quality of service than you can build yourself. Leverage specialists. Bring them in. Let them teach your team instead of doing the work. So if you get somebody in that costs a lot of money, don't let them sit there in a corner and build something because that's a waste. Make them teach your people how to do the job because they're going to go away and just leave behind something that um, you might not understand. Let them teach you how. That's why you're paying them a lot of money. Cattle, not pets. I first heard that term a few years ago. Somebody at Netflix coined it. Where does it come from? Well, uh, that disposability in the previous frame. It should be disposable. Now, if you walk into a um, room where a group of uh, developers and um, system administrators are having a coffee and laughing and joking and you say uh, server X has got smoke coming out of it and two people drown in their coffee. Then those servers were pets, not cattle. So cattle implies that people don't care if that server dies because there's going to be another server that take over. If you're running something like Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes, they will actually pick up that something has gone down and they will spin up uh, the same instance again and you will know nothing better. So the moment you give that server a name, it's become a pet. So obviously there are going to be pets. And that's during, let's say, your incubation phase when you are trying stuff and learning how to configure the stuff. And then eventually, when you have a test environment and a production environment, that's all just cattle. And then automate. Automate, automate, automate everything because it will save you a lot of time. And it be becomes a description of how to run the system. Golden rule, seven plus or minus two. Now that applies to the size of your team, um, 
numbers of um, classes in a package. There's so many places where you can apply this rule and you'll find that it, it sticks. Why? Because it uh, speaks to the limit of human cognitive ability. If you give people a number of more than seven digits, you'll find that the number of people that can remember that number and recite it to you a few minutes later drop off sharply with every number you add. So um, that number comes in everywhere. Now let's talk a bit about microservices. They're more about technology. They, they, there's more about them than technology stacks. Uh, Cross-functional teams should own a microservice. In other words, it's a team composed of more than just developers. There should be somebody who's focus, who has a focus on testing. Uh, somebody has a focus on the business. Uh, somebody has a focus on um, uh, the, uh, uh, the system side and you work together to own this thing. And then you realize, but it's not just that micro because it, 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 it should actually be capable of doing quite a lot. Um, you typically start with a single application and you only split it when complexity warrants. As I've said before, when people start falling over each other to try and get something done, uh, that's typically when you um, when you split things up. Don't split prematurely. On one at least one coherent business outcome uh, within a microservice. If a business outcome is split across multiple microservices, then you already have a challenge, and um, uh, that is something to look out for. You want to fix the impedance mismatch between system and organization. Um, who has not heard of Conway's law? Now, Mr. Conway is still very active on Twitter, and he's still thinking about people and organizations and how they interact and how to solve the problems of the world. So you can go and follow me on Twitter, and I think he's Conway's underscore law or something like that. But um, that mismatch between the system and the organization is going to cause a lot of headache and you want to get the two aligned, which typically means that uh, you want to align the organization according to what you are delivering to the customer, because then uh, you will have people that focus on that. And yes, you will have a, uh, um, a team that focuses on uh, database administration if you are running your own um, data center, or even if you have a large organization and you're running everything in the cloud, you will still have people who specialize in certain areas um, who sit together and who focus on that only. But you want some of them to be embedded within teams or to share time between multiple teams so that they can help them and share knowledge without having a situation where they get a request and it takes a few days before the team gets an answer and then it is going to slow them down because all of this is about finding how we are slowing down and preventing that. So uh, this is another quote that I came up with. It says, uh, microservices is to service-oriented architecture as agile is to waterfall. So it's trying to make things faster. And that's supposed to be the big difference because SOA is about this one big thing that can expose a lot of services and it has one bus. Whereas the idea with microservices is to have independent things that only talk to what they need. And those things focus on one good business outcome at a time. Uh, whereas SOA was about multiple small services and uh, you need a whole registry to go and find them. Whereas with microservices, you should be able to name all of them on your hand. Um, once again, if an organization is more than seven microservices, uh, uh, then um, uh, it might mean that there's something wrong or they are a huge um, organization. So 
what does a microservice um, architecture look like? Well, you typically have um, backing services like I showed you, um, and those are uh, system type services. You have platform services, which are things like a registry and configuration services. Then you have application typically in a container because you want to be able to uh, have disposability and containers give you that. And you will have some web service with load balancing in front of it. Now, this describes Cloud Foundry and various installations of Kubernetes and lots of other things. You can plug, um, uh, uh, um, you can change these names and list a whole lot of AWS or Azure um, services that cover the ground um, on this image. Um, and you are typically going to be building multiple applications that will talk to the user and they might talk to each other and they might talk to each other via some kind of um, messaging mechanism. Um, what technologies are available? So I did this slide a few years ago and I went through and I said, no, there's not that much more. I might have missed something, but um, it's still pretty much the same game. Um, so IaaS, Infrastructure as a Service, provided by AWS, Azure, SoftLayer, uh, Rackspace, DigitalOcean. You might have heard of SoftLayer, otherwise known as IBM Cloud um, or IBM Often Cloud. Um, PaaS is Platform as a Service. So um, that's things like Cloud Foundry, OpenShift, Heroku. Um, and um, there's things coming up. Uh, Azure launched uh, Spring Cloud, uh, Azure for Spring Cloud, um, which is basically a platform as a service focused on Spring Boot applications. And you are going to see those types of things coming up where a platform is provided around a certain stack. That means a whole lot of headaches just goes away. And what you have to do to deploy an application is to write a, a, a very small YAML file, not a multi-page, um, uh, multiple YAML files to try and deploy something. Containers, um, uh, if you don't know Docker, then uh, welcome out of your coma. Um, RKT is another container spec you might not even have heard of but it's doing very well. And um, there's actually a standard format for a container image. And um, Spring Boot now has that built in. So it can build a container image that will run in both Docker and RKT. So whether your platform leverages Docker uh, containers or RKT or something else, um, there's a container format that you can use to provide them with a container. And if the platform is really nice, then you just give the platform your application and it knows what to do with your application. Um, you have container orchestration. Uh, Kubernetes is um, um, big in that game. I know of one organization that's running Docker Swarm. Um, and I think that was an accident, um, but um, it works. And um, it's actually quite a bit simpler to operate than Kubernetes is. Um, don't try and roll your own when it comes to Kubernetes because um, you are going to come out the other side and um, um, having uh, be a different person with a different view on life. And um, you might be even trying to end your own life because it can get uh, very ugly. So you literally pay somebody to run Kubernetes and then you will have something that works. Uh, monitoring. So in that space, there's a lot of activity. Um, what you see there is a list of products. In the time since I first did this five years ago, there's now lots of standards that have come to the fore. So, which is important because you actually want to push out your logging in a format that is 
either an open standard or a, um, a de facto standard and um, so that you know anything can consume uh, your logs and that um, they'll be available to um, in a searchable format in some way and in a um, visual format when it comes to uh, some kind of tracing and all kinds of ways of looking at your um, uh, the state of your application. Uh, there's distributed caching. Now these are still the main players in the game. Uh, there might be some that I've missed and you're welcome to let me know so that I can update the slide. But they all have uh, uh, some overlap. EH cache is purely a, um, a cache. Hazelcast is a cache that also uh, exposes the same API as Memcache, for example. But Hazelcast also supports um, atomic objects. So it has an atomic integer, an atomic double, it has atomic maps, which means that you can basically have a shared object that um, uh, you can update. So you can tell Hazelcast add x to this integer and give me the result. So that means that this result that you get back is unique. And now you can save that result in the database. Um, and um, Iselcast has the new representation, which is the one that it just gave you. And if there's another update, it will follow. And that one will then um, uh, be able to use that afterwards. So um, Iselcast has got a, um, a few things like that. It has built in pub sub. So this is not an adver advertisement for ISO course. It's just to tell you that this thing is actually pretty impressive in what it can provide um, out of the box. You can embed it in your application, which makes it very easy. So you have a Spring Boot app, you can have ISO cost embedded and configured to find each other. So each instance you stand up, they will talk to each other. You'll have a distributed cache. You can have distributed um, um, atomic objects and um, you can have a distribic, uh, distributed uh, publish and subscribe, uh, which means you might not even need a message queue of some kind unless you uh, what you are distributing is an event that um, uh, um, uh, you want to preserve. So for example, let me give you an example. If I have an application that has multiple users connected and I let to, um, uh, um, I need to notify them of something that's happened because they've connected, then Hazelcast uh, PubSub will do great. Um, if they're not connected, the first time they start up, I'm gonna give them that information because the representation of that information they're interested in is in the database. And thereafter, they will get updates to that information from Hazelcast. So once again, I don't need to put that into a, a message queue that's persistent. So if you need non-persistent uh, pub sub or message queues, Hazelcast does that uh, fine. Um, InfiniSpan, I think is more of an in-memory grid so that means it's got um, uh, caching capabilities, but also um, you can store data structures and query them. Same you can do with Hazelcast. Um, Memcache is just a, basically a key value store in memory. Redis has got a lot of overlap with Hazelcast in terms of atomic operations and pub sub and things like that. Uh, one downside is Redis. Um, is internally single threaded to give you uh, uh, ordering guarantees and that can sometimes bite you um, if what you're trying to do is too complex so if you keep it simple redis will do fine um, couchbase is a key value store um, that also happens to be persistent which is um, handy so um, if you want the outcome to be persistent then couchbase is a is a good option um, service registries Console is a great combination of registry and uh, configuration service. Eureka is a service registry. Etcd is a service registry. Zookeeper um, uh, service registry also does um, uh, distributed state management 
uh, that's why zookeeper lives in the middle of um, um, oops Kafka. So um, lots of these tools have some overlap. You'll see you can use con um, Redis as a configuration service because it's also persistent. Um, Zookeeper you can also use as configuration. People use Git as configuration. A Spring con Cloud Config is actually a service that you point at a Git repo and it will serve the content uh, property files from the repo as configuration. And you can update the Git on the other side and it will serve the updates. So um, you'll see a lot of these services overlap and you have to choose carefully what you want to do um, and um, be pragmatic. Spring Boot is in the Java world is, um, well, uh, when I did this, as I say, uh, five years ago, it was probably the only game in town. Uh, things have changed. There's um, um, Micronaut and Caucus um, um, in the race. Uh, with slightly different focus, but um, a huge amount of overlap. Spring Boot is a way of building standalone applications that contain everything you need in one jar. So the jar is a bit bigger than you would expect, but it has an embedded web server and embedded database drivers and anything else you need for the dependencies that you're using. Um, supports uh, Java, Kotlin, and Groovy. Um, it has very opinionated auto configuration, which has made configuring Spring a lot easier than it used to be, which means that there's auto configuration means it detects that some classes are on the path, so it starts configuring them. And uh, there's some properties available to change that default behavior. So you can get very far with minimal amount of work. So if you want the database connection, you basically need to um, have a JDBC driver and one of the starters that uh, is gonna initiate the database, whether it's a, um, Spring Boot, JDBC template uh, starter or um, JPA or um, Spring Data. Um, JPA or Spring Data JDBC, any of them is going to ensure that it'll create the data source um, uh, for your application. And obviously, for to create the data source, it needs um, a URL to the database server and credentials. But boom, there you have it. You, so it's a few properties you provide, and all the rest is done in an opinionated way. And um, it's usually good defaults. Inversion of control and dependency injection is where Spring start. I'm not gonna give you a, a lecture on that. You can Google those terms and um, study up. And if you've got questions, send them along. Uh, some of the um, most common Spring starters that people use, Spring Data JPA, Spring Data MongoDB, Spring Data CouchDB, Spring Data Neo4j, or if you want to um, interact with people or applications, Spring MVC or Spring Webflow gives you uh, HTTP or REST endpoints and Spring Security allows you to secure that. Webflow gives you a reactive application uh, leveraging um, uh, um, uh, various reactive APIs based on uh, reactive streams. And um, it allows you to build a scalable application, but there is a cost. It uh, places a bit more of a cognitive load on you as the developer, but it's a paradigm that you get used to very quickly and then you can be efficient. And I've done a lot of work to try and make it as easy as possible. And then you can embed uh, Tomcat, uh, Jetty or Undertow as your, as your web server. And, um, there you have an application. Oh, there's a section below the line that talks about um, Spring Starter integration, uh, Spring Starter Batch, Kafka, Spring Cloud, which is a whole list of um, uh, starters. There's a Spring Cloud for AWS, Spring Cloud for Azure. Uh, then there's a Spring Cloud 
config, there's a generic Spring Cloud core, which gives you a lot of capabilities. So there's an example. There's a thing called refresh scope. So refresh scope is an annotation you can add to any um, service or um, uh, something that you know depends on um, external config. And when it's annotated with refresh scope, it basically um, is accessible uh, so that it can be recreated when a configuration changes. So if you're using Spring Cloud Config and it detects that um, the configuration is changing, how will it do that? If you're in um, Spring Cloud Kubernetes, it can actually get a notification from Kubernetes when you make a, a config change um, in an external config map. And that config map is an object that um, Spring Cloud Config can read and um, pull in when the application starts. So this is not the case where you inject the config map into the container as a property file somewhere. This is where the application actually pulls in the config map and Kubernetes itself is not aware that um, that config map is injected into the application because if it is, it'll restart the pod and you'll have a brand new application and you'll have um, 30 seconds of downtime on that pod before it's up again. In this case, you are reading the, uh, the, the, the config map. You can detect the change on the config map, read in the config map and recreate all the services that are annotated with refresh code. So your application can internally um, refresh based on a config change. Um, Spring Cloud Dataflow. This is a very powerful way to build um, uh, a data pipeline that do various things because they can, um, uh, you build basically, um, I wouldn't call them microservices, I would call them nano services because they each are very small, doing one piece of data manipulation, handing over to another via, typically via a message queue. And, um, each stage uh, does something, but it can um, break out the work into multiple um, um, batches so that each of these things are manageable in size and that when work needs to be aggregated, it can aggregate it and eventually come out the other side and you can deploy all these nano services into um, things like uh, Kubernetes or Cloud Foundry or even uh, run them all in one um, uh, machine that just has a Docker environment. But it's a very powerful way to quickly compose a data pipeline uh, that do various interesting things. So let's look at the lifecycle architecture. Now, um, uh, uh, you'll have a developer IDE and we can have wars about which one is the best, but typically it has an editor, it provides build, it provides support for doing test-driven type development and for doing refactoring. If your IDE doesn't support good refactoring, uh, then I'm sorry, then you're, uh, you're a step behind the game. You want good source configuration management that supports revisions and branches and tags. Um, you move your IDE, uh, into um, configuration management. You move from configuration management in, from source configuration management into a binary repository via a continuous integration. So there's a build pipeline that will build something and put it in the binary repository. You move user automation engine to move from configuration management into a binary repository because some artifacts go straight across. Um, you take an application package and you put it in a container or you use it to create a container. Um, you have configuration that you associate with a container to run. So these are all the things that are in play and are things that you have to discuss or examine as to do they make you go faster or slower. Tools. So um, if you haven't heard of Git, then um, once again, welcome out of the coma, or maybe it's the reason for your coma, I don't know. Uh, Mercurial, you might not have heard of, but uh, to, according to the people who know, it's, a, it's actually better than Git. 
um, I've worked with subversion for a long time and um, um, I knew all its ins and outs and I enjoyed it quite a lot. And in some ways it was, um, uh, some things were easier to do than in Git. Um, some things were more difficult. Um, I can work with a huge code base much more efficiently because I can check out um, parts of the tree uh, very easily, whereas in Git that can be very difficult. So if you've got a mono repo, then subversion is your friend. Uh, continuous integration. Uh, Jenkins has been in the game a long time. Funny enough, I haven't used Jenkins in a while because I'm using uh, Gradle as my main build. I just need something that can say Gradle and a list of parameters and I get a job done. So Jenkins with all its plugins and stuff becomes much less uh, important. But there's uh, uh, Bamboo and Team City. These are typically things people run um, on premises. Um, and then um, there are multiple tools doing continuous integration in association with the various um, repositories. With GitHub, you have, um, uh, oh, Rory, what's it called? Um, uh, GitHub something actions or. Uh, I haven't used it yet. Yeah, it is GitHub yes. Actions. Um, and uh, GitHub Actions is available, uh, but it's not available on GitHub Enterprise, which is, yeah. they're, they're <laughs> going to launch that now. Yeah. So uh, you have GitHub Actions in Bitbucket. You have Bitbucket Pipelines. Um, uh, GitLab has got um, pipelines. So all of these still provides a way to run a pipeline so that um, the necessity of a Jenkins or a Bamboo becomes um, um, uh, uh, much less because uh, we've simplified how we build it and we've encoded it in a way that um, means that we don't need um, uh, 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 this massive tool anymore. Binary repositories, Nexus Artifactory, between those two tools, you can run in multiple kinds of repositories. So they can both be Docker registries, they can be Maven repositories, they can be NPM repositories, and 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 the list goes on. And they do that job very well. Automation engines, these are things that are dedicated at automation. Ansible, Chef Puppet are uh, the big ones in the game. But a lot of what they've been doing have been um, taken over by the platforms as a service because the platform does a lot of the work and the platform gives you a simple command to run and you don't need Ansible to run a simple command. You can put it in um, your GitHub action or in your pipeline or whatever. So um, these things become hidden from you because they sit behind the scenes and they do a lot of the, of the hard work. Um, so now the microservice team activity looks like this. Everybody is involved in everything. And that's how it should be because without visibility of the whole thing, you don't know what's going on. You don't know how to fix a problem. You don't know where you're slow. You don't know, um, you have too many unknown unknowns and you just want to have a list of known unknowns. Um, because that means that you know where to go and look to make the known unknowns known, and then you can resolve your problems. And um, I didn't use the word DevOps once. Uh, because all of this is actually what a DevOps should be. So, uh, any discussion, questions, I invite you to... Um, I've gone nuts. I am going to stop the screen share so that we can see each other. Others.